Hello and welcome to episode 337 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leeds. Damien, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm excited this week, Andy. Buzzing because in last week's show, right at the very start, we asked you to send in your reviews because we hadn't had any reviews, surprisingly, for quite some time on the podcast and you delivered and Andy, in a second, is going to read those out, but he's going to read, I think, three of them. Is that right, Andy? You're going to read the first three that came in. Everybody who sent in a review this week will get their Money to the Message mug, and we will read some of the others out on a, on a future show. But please do keep sending the reviews in. They're incredibly motivating. I did have somebody write in and ask me, how do you leave a review? But if you go onto the app of choice, that you have. So if you're using the podcast app via Apple, such as an iPhone, you can go and find our show. And in there, you can just click to leave a review. So it is pretty straightforward. So do give it a go. Some of you did leave positive feedback on the website articles relating to the actual show itself. So there were two people who did that, some fantastic feedback on there. So that is very much appreciated as well. So Andy, if you want to go through a couple of the reviews. Yeah, let's start with a British Canadian who said, this show is one of the very few personal finance podcasts that I'll listen to every week without fail. The hosts are great and the advice they give is set me on track to be able to be financially independent many years before I'd expected to be able to. Thank you very much. The next one is from Kind at Heart, a frank, honest and interesting financial show that provides current relevant financial information in a way anyone can understand. And moving on to the final one we'll do for this week, as you say, we've got more than that. And thank you again for it. This one's Tom R23, who said it's a great listen, very informative. And being a young person, I believe this podcast will aid my financial success in the future. In a way, that one's one of the ones I'm most proud of because it's kind of bringing the next generation through. I like the, us oldies can still do it. We, we can still do it. We've still got it. We're down with the kids. So thank you for sending in those reviews. Please keep them coming. They help with the podcast, pushing up the charts. And also it's incredibly motivating for the team. So I do share the feedback with the other members of the team because they will be on the show on regular intervals. Actually, I will mention that I won't be on the show again next week. We're going to have a another team takeover, which although it was the first ever won only a few weeks ago i'm moving house next week so i'm not going to be around at all i'm going to be lost in boxes and chaos so the team are going to take over for next week but i will be back as usual the week after that it's going to be a weird sort of position for you because you'll be listening to the podcast for the first time having not been on it probably while i'm packing the boxes putting the plates away in the kitchen or something (laughs) yeah more than likely andy and probably cursing the house that i bought as it falls down around my ears one other thing before we carry on with the show did you notice the music? Regular listeners should have noticed that the theme music changed on the podcast. It's a work in progress, but we've had somebody who has written a couple of tracks for us. And this is one of them that we're probably going to use going forward on the podcast. Tell us what you think about it. And the reason we had to do that is because when we share our podcast on socials, despite the original track being free to use and everything like that, it did start to limit its usage because we didn't own the copyright. So why not being a podcast, one of the biggest and best podcasts in the UK that deals with money? And we've been around about six years now. I think it's about time we had our own music. So hopefully you like it. Great. So that sort of moves us on then to what's coming up in this week's show. So Damien, what have we got? So I'm going to do a piece on investing. This is a piece that's going to go through 8020 Investor. Now, I've been doing 8020 Investor for, I think it's six, nearly seven years now. And I run my own investment portfolio and do lots of different pieces of research, the unique stuff that I come up with. And I'm going to go through some of those pieces in a bit of a roundup, my favorite takeaways. So that is something that's basically giving podcast listeners free access behind the curtain to be able to see what we do on 8020 Investor. So I'm going to go through a load of those. It'll be incredibly insightful. I'm then going to talk about furnished holiday lets. So there's a move from people who are buy to let landlords moving into holiday lets because of the tax benefits of doing so. There's been a big shift. So I'm going to look at what's going on and whether it's worth doing it. And finally, I'm going to talk about whether it's worth borrowing more money, additional money when you remortgage. Okay, so let's start with the main piece of the podcast then. And we're going to be talking about investing and going back over some of your biggest hits, if you like, uh, looking at the research pieces that you've done and the ones you're particularly proud of. Yeah, 
I'm smiling at you, Andy, because it sounds like somebody who, you know, when artists release their greatest hits album, it normally means the career's either ending or they're changing labels. It's not actually normally a positive, but <laughs> this is kind of a greatest hits of 8020 Investor. So what happens is I release a couple of pieces of research every month on 8020 Investor, along with all the other stuff that's on there, such as fund shortlists, weekly newsletters, monthly newsletters, etc. And you can sign up for a free trial if you want to, to see more what's going on there. And basically, I teach people how to invest their own money. And it comes from a career of doing that in the city for wealthy clients. And I'm going to run through, I originally thought what I'll do is I'll pick, say, my top five favorite pieces of research. And as I started to write the list, I got to like 20 titles that I've done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read them out. And Andy, I'm going to let you pick five of them. And I'm going to give people the insights that came from that piece of research. So one of the early ones I did was called the annual Chinese equity rally, which looked at a phenomenon that exists in Chinese equities. Probably my favorite piece of research I ever did was the perfect ISA portfolio, which was one about where I designed a portfolio looking at history. And I did this back, I think it was 2015, for a portfolio, could we make one that had never lost money in a given tax year since the year 2000, had a static asset allocation, and had outperformed the FTSE 100 since the inception of ISAs. Now, what was great about that piece of research was that I did it in 2015, and yet the findings have been proven to still hold true for the next five years. So every year that portfolio has still achieved those feats ever since. Uh, the winter portfolio was one of my favorites, where that was looking at portfolios that outperform in the winter. Uh, there's a definite phenomenon there. Funds buy cheap buy twice. While I was looking at whether you should invest in cheap funds. Does it actually improve your investment returns? Uh, should you ever invest in gold? If so, how much? Uh, the best strategy in a stock market crash, stick or twist. That was a very popular piece. How to make your portfolio immune to stock market volatility. We touched upon that in actually podcast 57 because some of these pieces did feature in past podcast shows. So where that's happened, I'll try and dig them out and link to them in the show notes of this particular podcast. Uh, how many funds should you have in any given sector? So if you're investing in UK equities, how many funds should you have before you actually start diluting the benefits of diversification? What's the most profitable day of the year to start investing, which was an unusual one? Best way to invest cash, is it to drip in or do you go in all at once? Uh, what's the highest charge you should pay for an investment fund? Do active funds outperform passives in sideways or falling markets? We touched upon that one in podcast 229, so go back and listen to that one. Is manager performance down to luck? So fund managers are active. Is it down to luck when they outperform? How often should you rebalance your portfolio? Should you follow star fund managers? Are funds with performance fees worth it? Uh, another piece I did was how often should you check the value of your portfolio? I'm up to number 18 at this point. I was only meant to be picking five. Sectors where active funds beat passive funds. How often should you change your funds in a portfolio? Does a new all-time high make a market crash more likely? What are the best all-weather portfolios? I analysed that and I did give some findings in episode 278 of the podcast. So all-weather portfolios are those that are supposedly meant to do well, regardless of what's going on in the sort of macroeconomic backdrop and investment markets. An investment piece on how to navigate market tops and bottoms. There are some indicators to look at. And the summer portfolio combined with the selling May and go away adage. Now, there's a whole host of others I could have put on that list, such as funds for stagflation, funds for Brexit, funds for the UK general election. I just picked a short list, which was quite long. So, Andy, what I'm going to get you to do is pick five of those. So I will give the listeners the insights from those pieces of research. But what it does, it lifts the curtain to tell people, look, if they want to know more about investing, then they can find out on 8020. Okay, well, you've kindly kept the page open with all the big hitters there. So I'm, I'm literally going to run my finger down. Winter portfolio. Um, what's that one about? So we did a piece on this in podcast 297, actually. So that is regarding the phenomena of UK stocks outperforming over the winter period versus the summer. So if you look at the winter period between November to the end of April, UK stocks tend to do better during that period than they do during those summer months or the other months. And the research looked at what would happen if you simply bought equities during those winter periods and then went into cash 
in this during the summer and kept repeating that process now go back and listen to episode 297 when i go into more detail about what happens if you use trackers etc and the numerical results but the overall gist of it is that you can capture pretty much all of the upside in equity markets if you use a winter portfolio strategy invested during november to april and then in cash during the summer and that is based on looking at history going back over time now there are periods where it didn't work and what is particularly interesting that you picked this one is that like i said episode 297 was done around november 2020 so i looked at this piece of research on 8020, did a piece on the podcast where I mentioned about this phenomenon existed. But the year before, in 2019, the winter portfolio strategy did badly. And it's because of the pandemic came along and wrecked everything. You remember in the February of 2020, markets started to tail off and they collapsed in March. So it didn't matter what you bought, you were going to lose money in equity markets because they crashed, didn't they? And I said at the time in November 2020, I said, This year should, if you go back and listen to it, hopefully be positive for this strategy because we've just had a vaccine. The vaccine had been announced about a week or two before that. And it's interesting because I was proved right, which is always nice because sometimes you're not proved right. And one of the other things the research has shown, if you want to use this strategy, you are better picking an active fund in the UK mid cap universe. So pick a UK smaller companies fund an actively managed one because it's one of those instances which goes back and links nicely to another piece of research about the sectors that outperform when it comes to active managers versus passive strategies. Active managers in that universe, UK smaller companies tend to outperform passive trackers. And so what happened is I actually mentioned a fund in there. It's rare that I would do that. But I mentioned a fund was the Fidelity UK Smaller Companies Fund and said that one had been a a strong candidate, wasn't a recommendation. So I went back and looked at what happened from November 2020 to the end of April this year. Now, the FTSE 100 was up 27.19%. So it was a nice rally, UK equity. So that it proved again. The FTSE 250, that kind of mid cap space was up 31.95%, that's six months. Now, the summer period this year, if you look at the summer period, the FTSE 100 has just gone sideways. But that winter period, we had basically 32% on the FTSE 250. That is an epic return, given that the market already rebounded from those lows in the pandemic by the time we got to November 2020. The actively run funds, so the UK smaller companies unit trust sector, actually made 40.67% during the period November 2020 to at the end of April 2021. But the Fidelity UK Smaller Companies Fund made 51.56%. That's a huge amount of money during that period of time. And actually, it was the sixth highest return from any UK Smaller Companies Fund out of 46 within that sector. And some of the lowest ones produced about 17%. So it's been in the right fund that matters so i'd like to think this podcast has probably made some people quite a bit of money over that period of time i had that fund in my own 50k portfolio for example in 80 20 investor and i still hold it at this particular moment in time that's not a recommendation i'm just telling you what's going on in my portfolio at the moment so it just shows you the winter portfolio strategy work that came from that piece of research i now have my colors to the mask based upon that and gave a tidbit to the podcast listeners and if they decided to invest they would have made over 50 percent in that six month period so maybe if you have made some money out of that you might donate a bit to charity if you wanted to but it's up to you just keep it spend it do what you like so that was a really good one where you look at something you apply it and the future comes along and it could go horribly wrong but it turns out it actually almost proves the research and the strength of it Okay, good. Um, So let's pick another one then. We're going to run through five, aren't we? Let me just have a look. Uh, I'm going to pick this one. So what's the highest charge you should pay for a fund? So I'm talking about the AMC of a fund, so the annual management charge. And I did a piece of research where I looked at the performance over a period of time. So it was a five-year period of time of a fund and versus the cost of the fund. So we looked at, that would include sort of passives and actively managed funds. And you can look at the research in full if you wish, if you sign up to 8020 Investor. But what I did by plotting the performance of a fund over that period of time, that five-year period of time, and then looking at the cost of that 
fund, you could produce almost a, like a scatter chart, like lots of darts on a chart. One of my favourite charts, a scatter chart. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bizarre. But I know genuinely. I try, I try and find the pattern in the, you know, in the picture. Do you know what, Andy? I've got a maths degree and I've never had a favourite chart. So you, <laughs> you, uh, you surprised me. I'm always learning things about you, Andy. You have a favourite chart. So I drew the line of best fit, which will send Andy into fits of uh, ecstasy. And the conclusion that came from this is if you simply buy funds because they're cheap, it won't maximize your investment returns. And cutting costs doesn't guarantee improved returns. It's not a perfect correlation. But costs do impact performance over time. So I produced a table where I looked at funds that had a 1.5% charge and just used a 7% growth rate on £50,000. If you go to the extreme end, after 30 years, you'd have 242000 basically, if you'd invested in a fund with a 1.5% annual management charge. If you'd invested in a fund with a 1% annual charge, then you'd had 281,000, almost 282,000 pounds. So the difference was borderline 39,000 pounds difference just by being in a fund if you got the same return, assuming, but the charge was just that bit lower. Now, what the conclusion actually came from the research when you looked at the numbers, and I produced these scatter charts over different lengths of time. If you invest for five years, so that's the minimum term you should really invest for, then if you invest in the fund with a charge up to about one and a half percent, then it shouldn't have a huge huge impact on your returns compared to investing in something that was cheaper because it hasn't had enough time to compound and the differentials in individual funds performance is likely to be the biggest determining factor about your returns but if you start heading above 1.6 percent per annum then even over a five-year period it starts to hit your returns on your portfolio so the takeaway there is 1.5 percent is really the top end you want to be paying for funds on an investment portfolio and i'm ignoring platform fees here because i just looked at the underlying fund performance because the platform fees will be the same regardless of what fund you actually invest in so don't aim to pay any more than 1.5 percent if you're investing over five years if you go for 10 years or more then it really starts to have an impact and actually you need to aim for not paying more than one percent per annum for a fund so that becomes the sweet spot there but ultimately cost matters but it's still the underlying fund and investment choice that is key okay uh moving on then let's go for sectors where active funds beat passives okay i i did a bit on podcast 229 that talked about this but i didn't give away the sort of one of the golden nuggets on it. Um, and you're going to do that now? I've got, I, I've got to give you a, a golden nugget on this one. Now, I looked at different sectors. So imagine different asset classes, so UK smaller companies, global funds, and looked at how actively run funds, so those with fund managers, which tend to be a bit more expensive, compared to the cheaper alternatives of passive investments. So things like ETFs that just track indices. So I'm going to run through the sectors now. Um, some of the key ones that we did. So Asian Pacific, excluding Japan. Now, active funds within that sector underperformed on a relative basis compared to passive investments by a total of about 1.28%. Now, Chinese equities, they massively outperformed. I'm talking about the active funds here. They made more than 20% more because they were active funds compared to passives. European equities, that's another good space. Europe excluding UK, unit trusts, that sector, the active funds tend to outperform by about 13 to 14% over a 20 year period. Global funds, now you're, this is the area where active management seems to fall down. They tended to lag about 10 to 11% over a 20 year period. Uh, global emerging markets, again, it was down around about 11%. That's active versus passive. So stick to passives if you're investing in global versus global emerging markets is the sort of general trend. Of course, there will be individual funds that massively outperform. What I'm doing when I'm looking at the average of these actively managed funds compared to the passives. Japanese equities, actives marginally underperformed, again, passives. North American equities, this is quite a famous example, actually, that North American equities, fund managers struggle to beat the S&P 500. And over a 20-year period, it was almost 12% less that they've made so that's significant. Now, UK all companies, so that's the equivalent of the FTSE all share, is the passive index. Then active managers outperformed by nearly 4% over the 20-year period. So not a huge amount. But UK smaller companies is where the magic happens. 
And over a 20 year period, these actively managed funds outperform the small cap index by 100%. So that's basically making twice the money. And if you go back to the first bit that you asked me about the winter portfolio, you could see that in the numbers almost there, there were almost heading towards being double. So the takeaway was the golden nugget that I didn't tell you last time was that UK smaller companies funds are where the active managers really outperform and do really well. So that links quite nicely to the winter portfolio piece. So when you get all these different bits of research, you actually start to find over time that one of them leads on and actually confirms something you thought or discovered in another piece of research. Great. So number four, then uh, let's go for this one a bit further down. Is it worth rebalancing your portfolio and how often should you do it? Okay. For this one, I looked at the data for a whole bunch of asset classes over 27 years. So that was how long the data would go back. And I built a portfolio to just assume that the people had invested in an equal amount in each of these 17 different asset classes. So those asset classes included global funds, mixed funds, so you know the multi-asset funds, North American funds, equities that is, property funds, corporate bond funds, UK equities, small caps, uh, Chinese equities, the whole lot. And when we looked at the impact of rebalancing the portfolio over that extended period of time, so you imagine every year, every quarter or every month you rebalanced or you didn't rebalance at all you came up with a total return figure and that was actually going from 1991 which is the start of the data to that that point when i originally did the research was in the middle of 2018 hence the 27 years i mentioned earlier the portfolio that performed the best was the one where you didn't rebalance the number two was when you rebalanced annually when you rebalance quarterly it was third and when you rebalance monthly it was fourth basically so the more you tinker with it the more you mess it up well, that was kind of what it hinted at. But I did take it a step further. But if you just dwell on that for a second, it kind of makes sense. So what happens, you're riding a, a version of momentum, aren't you? So as things start to accelerate away, say like you had some UK smaller companies exposure, like I mentioned earlier on, let's imagine that was just one part of your portfolio. So it was only probably about three or four percent of your portfolio to start with. But as over time, that started to race away. By the time you got to the end of that 27 year period, you'll probably find that that fund of that asset class was making up probably more than 10% of your portfolio because the ones that had underperformed had shrunk in value, but that one started to dominate. That's what happens. And so your risk level increases. Does that make sense? Mm. Over time when you're not rebalancing. So you're kind of just going wild. It's just Lenin being allowed to run and over time equity markets tend to rise that's just a, a given over the long term maybe i've never thought about it like that it's almost like an evolution of your portfolio that is moving towards the things that are performing well yeah and i mean i actually did the numbers and if you did no rebalancing then by the end of the 27 year period 26 percent of it would have been invested in china wow. and only one percent of it would have been in strategic bonds where they all started out at around about 5.8 to 6 percent was invested in each sector that i've mentioned so you can see you just become something that starts morphing into a quasi asian chinese equity fund so that's why the, the, it starts to pull away but the reality is people don't invest like that people invest by picking an asset allocation that's a much more strategic because they want to manage risk so let's take something like vanguard's life strategy fund their 60 percent equity version what they might do is they might put something like 32 percent in north america equities about 20 percent in global bonds nine percent in european excluding uk and then you go all the way down to where asian equities are only about two percent of the portfolio so that is something that is much more representative of how people invest they don't just pick a range of asset classes with varying risk levels and then just buy them all equally so by trying to manage risk in this way that represents a more realistic portfolio now let's do the same exercise again over the same period of time what would have happened the one that came first was actually the one where you rebalanced annually and the one that came second was no rebalancing followed by six monthly followed by quarterly and then last but not least monthly rebalancing now you'll notice i said six monthly in that particular list i didn't do it in the original list but it's still the answer is still the same the point is that rebalancing annually 
is good enough and actually can boost your investment returns. Now, people may not realize they might have an advisor that says, oh, we, we will meet you every year. That's down to the fact they don't want to meet you every couple of months. It costs too much money. But coincidentally, they don't realize it, but revisiting a portfolio once a year can actually boost investment performance rather than just lead, letting it grow wild. So the message to this part of the podcast is review your portfolio, but chill a bit. You don't have to be tinkering away over and over again. Okay, then final one. Let's have a look. Uh, this one I'm finding interesting. So the most profitable day of the year to invest. Are we going to have another nugget here? We, we, yeah, I'm going to give you another uh, another nugget. Like all of these pieces I, I'm telling you, the full research that gives you more than what I'm telling you at the, on, on this podcast that you can apply it, you can find out if you go and read the actual research pieces. Now, the be- the best day, this piece of research was a, a slightly fun piece, but it was to see if there's any sort of pattern that occurs. If you invest on a given day, would it determine your ultimate outcome a bit like people who try and have their children born in september because they think it will make them all olympic athletes according to research i looked at the average rise in the FTSE 100 over a five-year period and i looked at that from the inception of the FTSE 100 which was 1983 all the way up to 2015 when i actually did this piece of research and i found that the most profitable day if you're going to invest for five years on average would be the third of january so bang in the new year. First day back in the new year is to put your money to work. Yeah, that's almost literally the first working day back. It, it? it is. Yeah. The next day was 10th of January, then the 24th of January, then the 17th of January, and then in fifth place was the 14th of Feb. That's Valentine's Day, right? <laughs> so could you ask me? But yeah, I think it's Valentine's Day. So the point is that there was a nice skew there. You do a piece of research like this and you you start to notice patterns. So if you took that one step further and actually thought, well, let's not focus just on days because the differentials can be quite small. What about months? Now, I'll give you the top five months. I'm going to guess January is the top month. Well, it's not actually. It's July, oddly enough. July was the month. And the way I worked that out was that it was the month with the most best days in, basically. But you can see the strongest days. This was going beyond the top five I was looking at, top five best days. But... You can see January was obviously second, uh, third was December, fourth was February, and fifth was March. Now, again, I just reaffirm the point that this kind of starts to point towards a bit what I said about the winter portfolio, because look, four of those five are in that winter period that I mentioned when equity market performance was strong. So that perhaps is one of the reasons why we're seeing this pattern. The other one is because don't forget, at the start of the year, there's a feel good factor. We see a massive surge in traffic and everything in January. Everyone's new, new year, new me, new money. And we also have the tax year end that happens. So people start to invest and rush to invest money before the end of the tax year. And of course, a flood of money into anything and any asset is likely to have a positive impact on prices to a certain extent. So July, why July? I don't really know why July is such a strong month, but it could be because people rush to invest just before they go away on holiday, before the summer lull. But there you go. Strong patterns in the early part of the year is when statistically you're likely to make more money if you start investing, put money to work. Okay, so moving on then, and we're going to be talking about buy-to-lets, but there's been a bit of a flip, isn't there, from people doing buy-to-lets traditionally now to to doing holiday-lets or turning them into holiday-lets. So why is that? So there was some research that was carried out by the government in the last few weeks, and it was published, and it showed that more than 11,000 second homeowners in England have flipped their properties to become furnished holiday lets since the pandemic, which is a huge shift. In fact, it's a 20% increase. So this boom in holiday lets has started to become ingrained. And it's a trend where you're seeing people now thinking, well, they may be buy-to-let landlords or wanting to get into buy-to-let, but are now pondering, is having a holiday let a better idea financially? Now, rental prices have boomed in holiday hotspots. That is one of the driving forces of why people are starting to notice and wanting to get into holiday lets because there's been a big rise in staycationing, isn't there? So holidaying in the UK, and that again is because of the pandemic. Anybody who's tried to book any kind of getaway in the last year has probably had to almost remortgage to do so. They'll know the prices have gone up and they can make some decent money. I mean, if you look at the average four bed cottage, that is at the moment as a furnished holiday let could average around about 21 grand a year gross as an income which is a lot of money so you can see that buy to let landlords have been hit over recent years could you remember buy to we've done it on the podcast so buy to let landlords had some very good tax release when it came to owning second property so they were started getting hit by the stamp duty 
additional rate. So they were having to pay 3% additional stamp duty on their buying properties. So that might have put people off buying new ones. But since April 2020, buy to let landlords can't deduct the finance costs from their property earnings and they only received basic rate tax relief on costs. So basically it meant they made less money. They were paying more tax. So buy to let started to become less attractive. And plus there were some changes in the laws of the Tenants Fees Act and the government's plan to abolish Section 21 evictions, which are effective without going into it. There were things called no fault evictions. It really meant that landlords financially weren't making as much money and benefiting from generous tax reliefs and their tenants were actually getting more rights. So as an investment, it became less attractive. What was interesting is that while there would obviously be an incentive in terms of income to get into furnished holiday lets, as I mentioned, and don't forget there would have been, during the pandemic, some people weren't able to pay their own rentals. So buy to lets became less attractive for that reason because people weren't able to pay rent. But the tax breaks still exist on furnished holiday lets. Now, if you meet a certain criteria, which is that your furnished holiday let has to be available to the public for 210 days a year and let out for 105 of those, then holiday lets can still deduct all their mortgage interest and other finance costs from their turnover before they calculate tax. That's basically as it was for buy to let. But now holiday lets still benefit from tax incentives. So you can see now that they're looking at the environment. So the increase in demand for holiday rentals, the tax benefits as well, and the negative aspects I mentioned about buy to let, that they're now shifting across. So this is clearly still a problem for people who wanted to buy their own homes, first homes, because the buy to lets are now just shifting to furnished holiday lets. So what is the truth then? Is it really, if you're a buy to let landlord, a good idea to flip over and get into being a holiday let, a furnished holiday let? Now, Love Money did some quite interesting analysis on this. They ran some numbers and they looked at a couple of fictitious examples of comparing being a buy to let landlord with running a furnished holiday let in two locations so they started one of them with Whitby we'll link to the article so people can read the numbers and they've made some assumptions in here and so they did the buy to let in Whitby which would be a two-bedroom holiday let so the holiday let would make 13 grand a year which is a pretty decent sum the rental income for buy to let landlord would be 7,872. So there's a big difference there already. What is interesting is the mortgage interest because they won't be able to get the same mortgages. There's buy to let mortgages and there's holiday let mortgages. So for the buy to let mortgage, the mortgage interest was £1,780 a year. For the holiday let, it was nearly 3000 But there was also a big difference in the fees associated with it looking at nearly a grand for the buy to lets versus three grand for the holiday let and of course there's running costs as well so you're looking at two thousand six hundred pound for the holiday let about eight hundred pound running costs for the buy to let now of course you paid less tax with the holiday let seventeen hundred pounds versus two thousand one hundred pounds taking all of that in the round when you looked at the profit the profit for a buy to let was two thousand two hundred and sixty pounds the holiday let the profit was £2,606 from those two different income figures that I mentioned. So a holiday let is definitely more profitable in this example. But given that the buy to let was generating just under eight grand, the holiday let was generating £13,000. That differential is we're talking about not even £400 in terms of profit. So people are overlooking, they're thinking about the tax incentive to uh, make an investment, which is always a bad idea. There's that phrase, never let the tax tail wag the investment dog. and this is a good example of that. Again, it's, there are assumptions in it, but they did one based in Fairfield, which is Liverpool. And again, I'm not going to go through all the numbers because you can look at the article, but for a buy to let, you would look at rental income of £16,716 versus a holiday let of nearly £33,000. The actual profit, after you take into account all of the tax and interest and everything like that running costs, the profit from a buy to let is £6,300 versus £9,166 for a holiday let. So, you can see that the profit was bigger in the Fairfield example, but given the holiday let income was twice that of the income from a buy to let, it isn't twice the profit you make at the end. So, and that again is because of the costs associated with it. So people do overlook that. And the other thing I want to throw out there is that you have to realize that you might be sitting there thinking, well, I'm going to turn my buy to let into a holiday let. There are places like London, for example, that can prohibit short lets for more than 90 days without planning permission. So you can't just do it all the time. You also would need to be the freeholder and it's obviously got to be furnished as well. 
And you can't just use a buy to let mortgage and turn it into a holiday let because some people think you can do, but technically you're breaching the conditions of that mortgage. So theoretically, the mortgage company could intervene if they found out. So if you took out a mortgage specifically for a holiday let, it would tend to be more expensive than that for a buy to let. And it's unlikely that you would get a loan to value that was much higher than 60 to 70 odd percent on a mortgage for a holiday let. So you're going to have to probably pay more up front to be able to do it. So there are pros and cons, but the reality is there are quite a few cons to doing it. Plus, you've also got to rent the thing out. So that means you've got to use Airbnb or whatever you use. You might end up upsetting the neighbours and all sorts of things. So it isn't just a one way street that a holiday lets are a guaranteed way of making more money. I suppose one of the key things here, if I was in that lucky position, I'm someone who doesn't like stress. So the idea of the holiday let for me, because you can kind of hand it over to Airbnb to do a lot of the sort of legwork for you, the fact that you know that you haven't got to evict someone, and actually you've got a second home that you can visit yourself for free, that might be quite nice. Yeah, actually, Andy, I couldn't agree more, because one of the things, I'll see if I can um, link to it. There's a good article that I read where somebody just talked about their holiday let and really the boil down to they loved their holiday let because they didn't really let it out all that much and they found it it was really a haven from life they had a social life down there so from i'm talking about a haven from their work life and stresses it was somewhere where they could really relax even though there were costs associated with it the positive nature of it the positive impact on their actual life and their family life life was significant so in that regard, holiday lets can have a place where if you want to make a bit of money, you can do. But if it's just literally an investment, then like you said, it's very close and it will come down to probably whether you want the hassle or not. OK, so moving on to the final piece then, and we're going to be talking about remortgaging. And the key question, should you borrow more when you're remortgaging? What's the answer? So I'm not going to dwell on this one because I'm, I'm conscious we've done a lengthy podcast, but that gives people plenty of listen to my voice for two weeks really because I'm not going to be here next week so this is going to be a quite a short punchy answer just to give you the highlights but it, it came about this piece because we were talking in the office and somebody was talking about and they bought a house a couple of years ago and they're thinking about they need to do a lot of work to it wonder if they could afford it or not blah 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 and then I highlighted the point about the property prices so they bought literally just before the pandemic before the world went completely batty and house prices were jumping 10 15 percent in less than a year and mortgage rates hit the floor like historic lows now that combination is quite attractive because it can be a good idea to look into borrowing more money for example if you want to improve your home and the value of your house has risen significantly from when you first took out a mortgage and also in this environment because mortgage rates have fallen You could probably find that if you speak to a mortgage advisor, get advice, do it early before your fixed term comes up. Let's say you've got a fixed term for two years. Look into whether you can borrow more money if you need to, because you may have benefited. Your house price might have jumped 10, 15 percent in the last two years, which is very likely in in reality. And mortgage rates could be better. And it means you could potentially boost your um, borrowing power when it comes to trying to take out another mortgage. The one thing you've got to bear in mind, obviously, is your circumstances. So how have your earnings fared and your own financial circumstances in terms of other debt, etc. So that is going to come into it because you have to do an affordability check when you remortgage and look to try and borrow more. But assuming that those things are in good stead and you've got enough income coming in so you can meet those requirements of affordability and in some cases where they use multiples, then there is no reason why you couldn't borrow more money. Go back and listen to our podcast on green mortgages. Just search the website, you will find it because it is possible if you're trying to do improvement to your house then you can get a cheaper rate with green mortgages you remember we did that a a few weeks ago and the other thing to bear in mind is to look at all types of borrowing because it may be if you're only trying to borrow a small amount of money you may be able to do it over the shorter term even with something like a loan that's unsecured that has a very low rate or even something like a 0% purchase credit card where you only want to borrow a small amount of money because over the long term you will pay less interest because don't forget if you put some borrowing onto your mortgage and you borrow more money, you're going to be paying that interest over a longer period of time, let's say 25 years to pluck a a typical term out of the air, then that starts to accrue and you'll end up paying more interest over the long term. And of course, 
Yeah, flip side of that, when wouldn't you want to? Well, there can be a whole range of circumstances, but typically if you're in a fixed deal that's got a high redemption penalty, so there's going to be an early redemption charge if you go and try and remortgage, that would be a scenario where you wouldn't probably look to try and borrow more money or if you've already got a high loan to value, you might not be able to. So make sure you speak to a mortgage broker because they can look at the numbers, they can tell you what's out there and they could even give you advice in the lead up to your remortgage on how to get your finances in order to increase your chances of actually getting the deal you're after. Okay, so that's it for this week. If you want to get in touch with Damien, you can do so in the usual way. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. Twitter is at money to the masses with a number two. We're on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and all the usual places. Please do review the podcast if you can. I know we mentioned it already in the podcast, but it really does help us to help more people. And Damien, we're going to be signing off now. You won't be here next week. We will miss you. Hopefully, we'll do a good job and we'll see you in two weeks. And fingers crossed for a smooth move. And you'll be in a new home. How exciting. It is exciting, Andy. But it's also incredibly nerve-wracking. And as I promised, we are going to do a bit of a moving special in terms of buying a house. Things that I've learned and a number of us have learned in the office over the last year or so. Because out of the, all of us in the office... One and half have actually bought a new house in the last 18 months. That's right. So uh, all that's left for me to say is until next time. Until next time. Oh.